the necklace. Matilda was a pretty and charming girl, born, as if by an error of fate, into a family of clerks. She had no means of becoming known, understood, loved, or be wedded to an aristocrat, and so she let herself be married to a minor official at the Ministry of Education. She dressed plainly because she had never been able to afford anything better. I suffer endlessly, feeling I am entitled to all the luxuries of life. I suffer because of my shabby, poorly furnished house. All these things, that another woman of her class would not even have noticed, tormented her and made her resentful. She dreamed of a grand palatial mansion with vast rooms and inviting smaller rooms, perfumed for afternoon chats with close friends. Yet I have no rich dresses, no jewels, nothing. And these are the only things I love. I want so much to charm, to be envied, to be sought after. She had a rich friend, a former schoolmate at the convent, whom she avoided visiting because afterwards she would weep with regret, despair, and misery. One evening, her husband came home with an air of triumph, holding a large envelope in his hand. Look, here's something for you. She tore open the paper and drew out a card on which was printed the words, the Minister of Education and Madame Georges Rampuneau request the pleasure of Monsieur and Madame Loiselle's company at the Ministry on the evening of Monday, January 18th. What do you want me to do with that? And what do you expect me to wear if I go? He hadn't thought of that. How much would a suitable dress cost? She thought for a moment, computing the cost, and also wondering what amount she could ask for without an immediate refusal. I don't know exactly, but I think I could do it with 400 francs. He turned a little pale because he had been saving that exact amount to buy a gun for a hunting summer in the country near Nanterre with a few friends. Very well, I can give you 400 francs, but try and get a really beautiful dress. The day of the party drew near and Madame Loiselle seemed sad, restless, anxious, though her dress was ready. One evening her husband said to her, What's the matter? You've been acting strange these last three days. I'm upset that I have no jewels, not a single stone to wear. I would rather not go to the party. You could wear flowers. They are very fashionable at this time of year. She was not convinced. The next day, she went to her friend's house and told her of her distress. Choose, my dear. First, Matilda saw some bracelets, then a pearl necklace. She tried on the jewelry in the mirror. You have nothing else? Why, yes, but I don't know what you like. Suddenly, she discovered, in a black satin box, a superb diamond necklace, and her heart began to beat with uncontrolled desire. Her hands trembled as she took it. She fastened it around her neck and stood lost in ecstasy as she looked at herself. Would you lend me this, just this? Why, yes, of course. She threw her arms around her friend's neck rapturously, then fled with her treasure. The day of the party arrived. Madame Loiselle was a success. She was prettier than all the other women, elegant, gracious, smiling, and full of joy. She danced wildly with passion, forgetting everything in the triumph of her beauty and success, floating in a cloud of happiness. Matilda and her husband left at about four o'clock in the morning. When they were finally in the street, they could not find a cab. They walked down toward the Seine till they found one. They were dropped off at their door in the Rue des Martyrs, and sadly, it was all over for her. In front of the mirror, she took a final look at herself in all her glory. But suddenly she uttered a cry. She no longer had the necklace round her neck. What is the matter? asked her husband. She turned towards him, panic-stricken. I have, I have, I no longer have Madame Forestier's necklace. He stood up, distraught. What? How? That's impossible. They looked in the folds of her dress, in the folds of her cloak, in her pockets everywhere, but they could not find it. Are you sure you still had it on when you left the hall? Yes, I touched it in the hall at the ministry. But if you had lost it in the street, we would have heard it fall. It must be in the cab. Yes, that's probably it. Did you take his number? No. They stared at each other, stunned. At last, Loisel put his clothes on again. I'm going back over the whole route we walked and see if I can find it. He left. She remained in her ball dress all night, her mind blank. Her husband returned at about seven o'clock. He had found nothing. He went to the police, to the newspapers to offer a reward, to the cab companies. Everywhere, the tiniest glimmer of hope led him. She waited all day in despair at this frightful disaster. Loisel returned in the evening, a hollow, pale figure. He had found nothing. You must write to your friend. Tell her you have broken the clasp of her necklace and that you are having it mended. It will give us time to look some more. She wrote as he dictated. At the end of one week, they had lost all hope. 
And Loisel, who suddenly looked aged, declared, We must consider how to replace the jewel. And so they went from jeweler to jeweler, looking for a necklace like the other one, consulting their memories, both sick with grief and anguish. In a shop at the Palais Royal, they found a string of diamonds, which seemed to be exactly what they were looking for. It was worth 40,000 francs. They could have it for 36,000. So they begged the jeweler not to sell it for three days. And they made an arrangement that he would take it back for 34,000 francs if the other necklace was found before the end of February. Loisel had 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He would borrow the rest. And he did borrow. He gave notes, made ruinous agreements, dealt with every type of moneylender. Then he went to get the new necklace and laid down on the jeweler's counter 36,000 francs. When Madame Loisel took the necklace back, Madame Forestier said coldly, You should have returned it sooner. I might have needed it. From then on, Madame Loisel knew the horrible life of the very poor, but she played her part heroically. The dreadful debt must be paid. She would pay it. They dismissed their maid, they changed their lodgings, they rented a garret under the roof. She came to know the drudgery of housework, the odious labors of the kitchen. She washed the dishes, the dirty linen. She carried the garbage down to the street every morning and carried up the water, stopping at each landing to catch her breath and dress like a commoner. She had to bargain at markets, quarrel and face insults over every miserable sou. Each month they had to pay some loans, renew others, get more time. Her husband worked extra every evening doing accounts for a tradesman and often, late into the night, he sat copying a manuscript at five sous a page. And this life lasted 10 years. At the end of 10 years, they had paid off everything, even the interest. Madame Loisel looked old now. Often she brooded over the past. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? How strange life is, how fickle, how little is needed for one to be ruined or saved. One Sunday, as she was walking in the Champs-Élysées, suddenly she saw Madame Forestier, still young, still beautiful, still charming. Madame Loisel felt emotional. Should she speak to her? Yes, of course. And now that she had paid, she would tell her all. Why not? She went up to her. Good morning, Jean. The other, astonished to be addressed so familiarly by this common woman, did not recognize her. She stammered. But, Madame, I don't know. You must have made a mistake. No, I am Mathilde Loisel. Her friend uttered a cry. Oh, my poor Mathilde, how you've changed. Yes, I have had some hard times since I last saw you, and many miseries, and all because of you. Me? How can that be? You remember that diamond necklace that you lent me to wear to the ministry party? Yes, well... Well, I lost it. What do you mean you brought it back? I brought you back another exactly like it, and it has taken us ten years to pay for it. It wasn't easy for us, we had very little. But at last it is over and I am very glad. Madame Forestier was stunned. You say that you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine? Yes. You didn't notice then? They were very similar. And she smiled with proud and innocent pleasure. Madame Forestier, deeply moved, took both her hands. Oh, my poor Mathilde. Mine was an imitation. It was worth 500 francs at most. 